my wife, the director of children's ministries, gave the best introduction to Bruce Main in terms of how he has impacted many lives in this country and around the world by his ministry. So by way of introduction, I want to speak more personally of my friendship with him for 24 years. I grew to learn, I learned of Bruce Main my first year in Bucks County at the Lenape Valley Presbyterian Church. They would host him once a year to preach in that congregation. And he is a man of God that I grew affectionate toward very quickly. And every year that I was a pastor there, for over 12 years, he would preach every uh, year in that congregation. And my affection, my admiration for him to continue to grow. So when I moved here in 2012, I was going to miss him. And I made it a point that I would have him come and preach for us occasionally just so that we can continue to be together. He has been a colleague in faith. He has strengthened my walk with Jesus Christ. He's strengthened my conviction of the power of prayer in many ways. But we also have fun with one another. And uh, early in 2013, after I've been your pastor for only seven or eight months, I shared with Bruce, I said, what I'm going to miss most about living in eastern Pennsylvania are the spring times. The spring times in eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey are the most beautiful springs I've ever had in my life. And here in South Florida, I was going to miss the spring times. So he took a picture in spring and sent it to me by text and said, look what I'm enjoying now. <laughs> That's right, Jim. Nice guy. As you can probably anticipate, I left my office, walked to the beach, <laughs> just south of the pavilion, uh, there is a sandy access to the beach where two coconut trees cross each other with coconuts. I framed the picture perfectly, the sand walk to the beach, the ocean, the coconut trees, a beautiful day. I took that picture, sent it back to him, and he responded, you win. <laughs> it is always a joy and delight when I have the privilege of introducing Bruce to this congregation, for he preaches from the heart and with conviction. Bruce, welcome to the pulpit of First Presbyterian Church of Delray Beach. Thank you. It's good to be here, although I do wish it was sunny, but it's not 25 degrees like it is in Philadelphia today. Uh, my wife's with me today, too. We've been married 36 years. If Pam, you could just wave. Uh, good morning. <laughs> she's the quiet one in the group. A uh, quick verse of scripture from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 12 familiar to many of you. The Apostle Paul writes, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. But regardless, I have learned, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for these words that are as relevant today as the day that they were penned. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you would have us learn today in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, I, I was reminded of a little story of, uh, you know, pastors sometimes our sermons don't land. <laughs> You know, people kind of missed the point. I know you never have this problem. <laughs> but um, I remind him of a guy, he decided that he was going to use some visual aids one morning to really emphasize the point. The sermon was about the importance of rooting one's life in good soil, in good things. And so he got four jars on the pulpit. One he filled with cigarette smoke. One he filled with whiskey. One he filled with chocolate and the other he filled with good soil. And so he's preaching along, and at one point he pulls out a worm from a bag and drops it in the cigarette smoke and says, look what happens. Everybody in the congregation moans. He goes on, preaches a little longer, gets another worm, drops it in the whiskey, 
worm dies, everybody groans, preaches on a little longer, drops the worm in the chocolate, the worm dies, everybody groans, finally he takes that last worm, drops it in the jar of good soil, and it wiggles, and it thrives, and so he looks out at the congregation, says, congregation, what's the point of the sermon? And this woman in the back raises her hand and says, well, if you smoke, drink, and eat chocolate, you won't get worms. <laughs> Remember that one, Doug. <laughs> as, as, as I mentioned this morning, we run a nonprofit ministry in Camden, New Jersey, inner city, and I often get phone calls from people. And a few years ago, I got a call from a guy. And uh, so I asked him his name, and he, is, he said, I, my name's Jack, Jack Harvey. I said, Jack, uh, why are you calling? He said, I, I'd like to volunteer at your organization. And I said, well, Jack, what kind of skills do you have? He said, well, I, you know, I can do pretty much anything. I can spackle, paint, unplug toilets. I can even cut grass. I looked out of my office window. The grass was about a foot tall. It was a hot August day. I said, Jack, uh, why don't you come down and cut our grass? I said, when can you start? He said, I can start tomorrow. I said, fantastic. So I said, look, I'll have the lawnmower outside the front door. I'll have the gas tank. You just come and get started. So sure enough, next morning, 9 o'clock, I hear the uh, lawnmower revving, and, and uh, I look outside, and here's this guy churning through our lawn. About an hour goes by. I finally feel so guilty because I'm in my air-conditioned office. I come outside. I run behind him. I tap on his shoulder. He stops the lawnmower, turns to me. I said, Jack. Thank you. This is such a great gift. And he said, Bruce, I lost my job last week. And God has given me the gift of time. And I want to share it with you. Wow. I, I don't hear that too often when people lose their job. But somehow, Jack Harvey had taken this circumstance in his life, and because of his faith, and because he really saw his life as a gift, he was able to choose a different response to that situation in his life. Our identity in Christ, I believe, a lot of times is made by our choices more than our knowledge. Do we choose? How do we choose? So the Apostle Paul this morning, he's writing to a congregation. The congregation is embedded in a world, a Roman Greco world, where there are religious and political contradictions. This young congregation, just like us, is trying to make sense of the world. And Paul reminds these people that choices are important. Remember in the, in the third chapter, Paul says, you know, you've got to choose between what's behind you and what's in front of you. You've got to choose between earthly things and, and, and temporal things and heavenly things and eternal things. You've got to choose between ingratitude and gratitude. You've got to choose between the mundane and that which is beautiful. And then he works up to this crescendo in verse 12 where the Apostle Paul, theologian, opens his heart a little bit to us and says, I have learned a secret and I want to share it with you. Whether I have a lot or a little, I have learned the secret of being content. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, we live in a culture that is fueled on creating a sense of discontentment, right? I mean, a couple years ago, I'm watching the Super Bowl. Before they even kick off, you know, Danny DeVito is telling me that I'm really eating the wrong Doritos. <laughs> you know, Justin Bieber says I need 5Gs in my cell phone, not Four. You know, Kim Kardashian says I'm using the wrong workout shoes. If I want joy, I gotta drive a BMW. If I want peace, I gotta lather with Irish Spring. You know, if I want to channel my civil rights, you know, I, I gotta drive a Ram truck. I mean, our culture is fueled on creating a sense of discontentment. And here's the Apostle Paul, all these years ago, saying, I've learned a secret. The secret of being content. 
Now, some of you may be saying, you know, that's easy for Paul to say. You know, Paul doesn't know my circumstances. He doesn't know my life. He doesn't know what I'm going through. But I think we need to understand this. Where is Paul writing these words from? He's writing them from a Roman jail where he is awaiting execution. And what we know about Roman jails is that they were literally holes in the ground. You only ate if your family brought you food. No three hots and a cot. This was tough. And who is Paul writing to? He's not writing to the Roman elite who have 401ks and great health plans. Paul is writing to poor folk who struggle. And so from this hellish place, Paul writes these words, I have learned this secret, and I want to share it with you. It's the secret of contentment. Now, some of you may, like me, say this guy is delusional. <laughs> or he's, you know, suffering some, some kind of detachment. But I believe that Paul is not delusional because occasionally I meet somebody, I think, who has discovered this secret. I remember a number of years ago, one of my favorite donors, uh, she was a 78-year-old woman from from Logan Memorial Presbyterian Church in Audubon, New Jersey. She had sent me a $30 check every month, but it wasn't the check. She'd send me a note, and she would just remind me that I was doing the most important work in the world, and I would just cherish those gifts. And Doris had had a tough life. She was a psychiatric nurse. Her husband died, left her four teenage girls to raise. It wasn't easy for Doris, but I'll never forget when she was diagnosed with cancer, she told me one day, Bruce, when I go to treatment, I always plan a trip to the mall or a trip or a lunch date with one of my friends. And I said, why, Doris? Because she said, why should it be a drag when I go get my treatment? When her daughter had that difficult conversation about what she wanted her to do with her body after she passed away, Doris winked at her and said, I always wanted to go to med school. That was Doris. One day I open up the mail. Instead of a $30 check, there's a $15,000 check. She said, dear Reverend Maine, take this. Use it for your capital campaign to build your high school. I was going to buy a new car, but I'm sending it to you instead. Two weeks later, I get a note from Doris again. It says, guess what? I went to the doctor. He said, I can't drive anymore. Didn't need the car. <laughs> that was Doris. At our eulogy, I'll never forget Pastor Painter. He, he stood in front of a congregation like this, and he said, Doris was the most pro-choice person I've ever met. And then he qualified. He said, not in the political sense, but she was just always choosing joy. Paul says in those four short chapters, rejoice 16 times. Choose. Henry Now, in the late Catholic theologian, he, he wrote that gratitude is actually difficult, but the more that we choose in our ordinary circumstances of our lives, the easier it becomes. The Apostle Paul, he, uh, he, 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 he shares this important message with us this morning. I love the little story of this gentleman who uh, he turns 50 and he's, he's going through a midlife crisis. And uh, so he decides to get away a little bit, Doug, and, and uh, so he enrolls at a monastery. And you can, at this monastery, you can only say two words every five years. So five years go by, he meets with the abbot and uh, he says, uh, food cold. Another five years go by, he meets with the abbot, he says, bed hard. Another five years go by, he says, I quit. <laughs> the abbot looks at him and says, I'm not surprised. All you've done since you got here is complain. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, gratitude is a, is a choice. Robert Edmonds, who studies a professor at University of Berkeley, he did a study a number of years ago, fascinating study, where he got three groups of people. And, in the first group, he said, at the end of each day, just take 10 minutes and journal hassles, disappointments from the day. 
The next group, he said, I want you to take 10 minutes at the end of each day and just journal ways that you demonstrate a superiority over other people. The last group, he said, take 10 minutes at the end of each day and just journal things that you're grateful for, things that delighted you. He collates the data after six months. Guess what? The group of people that was most joyful, most purposed, most peaceful was the group that just took 10 minutes at the end of each day to focus on the good things. A.J. Jacobs, he's a writer, he wrote a fascinating little book called The Thousand Thanks. He describes himself as a curmudgeon. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed 50% of the time. He says, I'm the kind of guy that 300 things go right during the course of the day, three go wrong, and I focus on the things that are wrong. So he decided to go on a journey of gratitude. Love this. For one year, he decided that he was going to thank everybody who was involved in creating his morning cup of coffee. So he goes to his barista in Brooklyn one morning and says, thank you. And she says, thank you back. And he says, thank you for thanking me. And, and they're going back and forth. And then he says, well, where, where did you get the beans? And so he drives over to the warehouse and he thanks the guys that are bagging the beans. And then he says, well, where, where did these get roasted? And he drives to the roaster and thanks the person that's roasting the beans and said, where did these beans come from? And they said, Columbia, here's the farm. He flies to Columbia, thanks the pickers. Flies back to New York, 98% of a cup of coffee is water, so he drives 90 miles north of New York to the Catskills Mountains and thanks the people that guard the reservoir of water. Reads an article in Wired Magazine about the, the aerodynamics of the lid on the coffee cup. And so he calls Doug in Seattle and thanks him for designing it. Over the course of the year, he thanks 1,000 people. And he says, I will never complain about paying $2.68 again for a cup of coffee. Why is Paul so adamant about learning the secret of contentment? Because I believe that Paul knew that content people are joy-filled people. Content people are liberated people. Content people have a sense of peace. Have you learned the secret of contentment? I'll close with this. We do a lot of work in Malawi, Africa. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. We run programs for children, and a few years ago I was over there, and I was staying in this missionary compound, and there was a mission family on furlough from Mozambique. And I'll never forget, they had a 10-year-old boy named Benjamin, and he was a precocious little kid, and we developed a little bit of a friendship. And one day I'm coming out of the laundry facility and Benjamin runs up to me and he says, Mr. Bruce, there's no hot water in the laundry room, but there is hot water in the showers and it's absolutely glorious. <laughs> A 10-year-old? I mean, when's the last time your kid came down and said, Mom, thanks for paying the electric bill? <laughs> But for a kid who is used to sponge bathing in the rural community of Mozambique, hot water out of a shower was glorious. But that's not what I remember about the trip. I was visiting one of our programs where we served the kids on a plastic plate, a boiled egg, a handful of rice, and some collard greens. And so I'm walking around talking to the kids, and I came to this one little girl, 12 years of age. Her name was Miracle. And I said, Miracle, what do you like about the program? And in broken English, she looked at me and she said, I like the program here because we eat like it's Christmas every day. A boiled egg, a handful of rice, and some collard greens and she eats like it's Christmas every day, and I have the audacity to complain when my candied yams are too sweet and my low-fat cappuccino oat milk triple espresso latte is too hot? It's an indictment against me and my spiritual maturity. And churches are even worse. I travel around and people complaining that we've had bagels instead of donuts and the font size is too small in the bulletin and the pastor's tie is the wrong color. At least he's got one. <laughs> I've 
Spiritual maturity is about how we respond to the circumstances in our lives. And this morning, Paul reminds us that there is a secret that we can learn, and it's called contentment. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for your word that is sobering, convicting, but that is truthful. And it calls us to live in a deeper place. So I pray for each of my brothers and sisters and myself as we journey to become more like you. Help us learn this secret of being content. Amen.